I think that whenever you go back to places that have historical roots for you, it's, it allows you to sort of vicariously relive some of the, the past fun times that you had. I mean, these were, these were heady times. These were really, really, um, the world was in turmoil. The business was in its infancy. I mean, a lot of times the, uh, the underpinnings for what later became the personal computer business were really being placed here. You know, that sort of stuff. There are all these links and connections. And uh, it's, in some ways, a little tiny bit frustrating because there was a time in the personal computer business where I knew everything that was happening. I knew the microprocessor, I knew the clock speeds, I knew everything. I knew every hard drive that was available and then all of a sudden it just goes like this. And, and, and so that, that feeling of control and, and, and an understanding just goes away. If you blink, all of a sudden the whole segment of the business moves in another direction. The games were fun because they had to be simple enough. The, the world was naive about video games. There wasn't a long learning curve. And unlike the video game, the coin-operated video game business today in which very few people play games. I mean, if you were to go down and, and ask a random number of people, when was the last time you put a quarter in a coin machine to play a video game, the number's pretty small. And what really happened is the games were very accessible to anyone because they were simple to play and yet challenging and fun. Um, later on, the business moved away from that and the games got, kept getting compl more complex and more difficult to play. If a typical person wandered into an arcade today with the possible exception of a driving game, they'd be hard pressed to play a, a fight, punch kick fight game and do any any good, they're very difficult. The greatest achievements, I believe, fall into sort of two different categories. One is sort of technical prog progress. The other side is sort of the game thought and, 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 and direction. I think if you go down the technical side, you have to start with the first phase of game development it was really on big massive computers that were non economic, but there were some interesting things done. Uh, space Wars is the, probably the pinnacle of development in that space. Then the Atari side really created what I call state machines. These were not, they used computer chips, but they weren't strictly von Neumann machines, which is a technical term for a machine that, that executes a program. Um, and then that phase stayed until Asteroids. And Asteroids was the first uh, coin-operated video game that had a microprocessor in it. And in that case, the microprocessor still wasn't fast enough, so it basically did a lot of the calculations, but you still had a huge number of chips that, were, that you had to do the interface with. From there, you go to consumer pong and the consumer side of the marketplace, which condensed everything into one chip, which allowed cost and reliability to be good enough that you could go in the home. So that's sort of, I think, a technical breakthrough. Um, and then the Stella in the 2600, which worked with a microprocessor to make a reprogrammable game. And that was where the cartridge uh, economic model was set up, which really allowed a razor, razor blade thing, because we made very little money on the hardware, but we made a lot of money on the software. And that's sort of been the metaphor for the gaming, for the consumer game business ever since. Um, then in terms of technology after that on the coin op side, um, it's been just evolution of bigger, faster, better, faster processors. Uh, better use of memory, uh, able to manipulate more and more polygons, which is sort of the standard litmus test of what is good. If you climb over on the, 
on the software, the entertainment side, you sort of go from what I'd call primitive black and white kind of boxy stuff to the point where you now are creating pretty realistic objects. Um, there was sort of the ball and paddle game phase of the marketplace, then there was the driving game phase, which is, is continuing on. And then you got into a, a point in time where there were these object games, these uh, puzzle games, um, like Pac-Man and, and uh, uh, Centipede and uh, some of these old wonderful classics that, in which you were sort of gathering and packing and chasing and running and, and everything against time. Um, then there was this other thread that was sort of starting at the same time on the computers which was probably started by Colossal Cave. And that was the role-playing, game-playing, uh, uh, action-adventure, where you were actually in a long-form game. This is, this is a game where you can play for days and days and days. And I actually think that was a very uh, important uh, milestone that uh, which has really spawned the mists and ribbons and, and a lot of the other uh, genres that are, have been popularized by Sierra and, and some of the other games like uh, companies like that. Um, on the uh, on the action adventure side, uh, the arcades have always been very good because they had good user interfaces. The home game side has always been plagued with bad user interfaces, <laughs> and you know not nearly as good. I mean, it's not as much fun to play a driving game with a joystick than it is to have a, st a steering wheel and a gear shift and a gas pedal. And so that's, uh, you're starting to get that more and more available in the home, but it comes at a price. I think that uh, the home game and the console games and then the divergence of the computer side was also another very important part because the computer allowed for a lot more creativity because programmers could, without a huge budget, come up with something that was really wonderful in the, uh, in the computer environment where it was much more difficult uh, on the home game side because the manufacturers are always creating huge barriers to entry because they want to control the marketplace. And so uh, I believe that we have much richer and more powerful games and the game space is more uh, interesting in the computer side because of that freedom. I think it's wonderful that the power today allows you to totally emulate uh, the things that were very difficult to do many, many years ago. And so that it gives access to anyone. These, uh, these games which, you know, like a you know, fine wine and old bottles or classics, uh, whether it be music or others. I believe that some of these games are classics and will continue to have play value forever. And, uh, and I think that uh, like so many times in the movie field and that sometimes the emulation is a step, but then there's a chance for sequels in which you take the basic gameplay and upgrade it to the, to the current uh, uh, market standard of color and sound and what have you. Now, I've known the people at Hasbro for a long time, and if anybody can do a great job of, uh, of reintroducing some of the wonderful games that, that we had, it's them. Uh,